dance makes me feel like my best self. I feel like I am more empathetic through dance, more sensitive. I believe that dance can heal. I believe that dance and music and togetherness is a way of life and belongs to everyone if they want to be a part of it. Like you can use dance as a tool. So I can use dance because of all the years I've spent re refining my knowledge and awareness of it. I can use it to make a dance to tell a story or I can use it to help brighten someone's day or I can use it, you know, I can use dance to communicate. Um, and I think that's the, the difference, but dance is really belongs to everyone. Hi, I'm Derek Mills. Welcome to the Globe Podcast. Mark Osmondson is behind the microphone again this week, guest hosting an episode about how to create safe, creative spaces where people can thrive. His guest is Al Blackstone, award-winning director, choreographer, and educator. In 2020, Al won an Emmy for his work on the iconic television show, So You Think You Can Dance. He's been developing dances for the show since 2016. He is currently on the faculty of Steps on Broadway, Broadway Dance Center, and Jump Dance Convention. He and Mark talk about fostering kindness, the value of safe spaces for creative people, and how to take care of yourself amid the stresses of pursuing a creative life. I hope you enjoy their conversation. Hello and welcome back to the Glow Podcast. My name is Mark and I am so thankful that you are here joining me today for this conversation. Um, I just wanted to start off today with just a little moment of gratitude for everybody that's been joining and listening to these conversations because it's really meant a lot for me to connect with you, to be with you. So just thanks, thanks for being here. And I also want to share a bit of gratitude to my amazing guest, Mr. Al Blackstone, who is joining me today. Welcome, Al. Um, I have a pretty funny story. Al is in the apartment with me right now. We are recording this podcast. However, we are not facing each other. <laughs> we are in different spaces of the apartment to make sure that the mics um, don't pick up on each other. So hi, Al, how are you? Hi, Mark. We're so close yet so far, yeah. <laughs> but I feel your energy um, near me, even though I can't see you at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly. Um, so we're facing away from each other. Uh, very, very funny, funny predicament that we're in. Um, but alas, I just am thankful to still be in the physical space with you and um, and sharing this. It's it's really special to me, and especially as our work is so physical and taking up space in the same room is is really important for us. So I'm, I'm happy that we're still in the same space together having this conversation. As am I, and thank you so much for having me. Yes, of course. So Al, I, I like to start off a lot by, especially with artists, just talking a little bit about where you started and about if there's anything from childhood or from when you were a young person that kind of brought you this insight as an artist or that was really, really an important moment for you in life. So welcome. And I always like to start there. Of course. Um, it's a good place to start at the beginning. Well, my parents were dance teachers, are dance teachers. Um, and I grew up in a dance studio, the studio that they had was attached to our home. So I was very, very privileged to have a dance room in our house. But I wasn't really um, particularly um, interested in, I took dance classes, but I don't, I can't say that I was really in love with it until later in my life. However, at least the class part of it, you know, the structured part of it. However, I didn't really have a lot of friends in the neighborhood. I wasn't really an outdoor kind of kid. So if I wasn't watching TV or like watching a movie, I would just go in the dance studio and, and play music and dance around. So that, and that was sort of my favorite thing to do from age, you know, probably six to 12. Um, and I think that that was really formative uh, to, to just 
the reason that I was going in there was for fun and to be creative. And I would just find whatever songs I liked that were on the tape deck, you know, on the, <laughs> up on the wall and play them and make up dances by myself. So sort of like in a, in a way what I do now. I can definitely relate to you um, in that respect too. That was totally me in my bedroom, um, just dreaming of dances. I used to specifically love thinking of music videos to my favorite music. That was always my, my go-to. Um, and I think that it's really reflective in your work as a dance educator too. So I, I wanna let you talk a little bit about what your philosophy is when it comes to dance education. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Al is, is, I know you've heard his bio from the beginning of the episode, but Al is such an amazing educator that really leads with kindness when it comes to movement education. So I just want to know a little bit kind of what your philosophy is when it comes to the approach of, of movement education. Wow. Um, you know, it's something that's evolved over the years. I think in the beginning, when I was teaching, I was teaching kids and I was teaching, you know, all different levels. Like I said, my parents had a school. So, you know, I had a lot of experience with different kinds of dancers, dancers that were doing it just once a week. And then eventually I got to teach, you know, the older kids and people that were a little bit more serious about it. And, um, and I'm grateful for that period of time and, you know, really I had the space to try new things and, and try different kinds of music and different styles. And I was really kind of figuring out who I was as an artist. And that, you know, continues into moving to New York and starting to teach here where it's like for a while, I think I was really just trying to prove something to everyone, you know, like showing my, my choreography and showing what I was um, capable of doing, you know, you're trying to earn your, earn your place or something. At a certain point, I think I just realized that I, you know, we walk into a room and there's people there. I, the ultimate thing that I've always, I think, wanted to do is just take care of everybody um, and make sure that everyone that's in that room feels like it's a safe space and it's a space that they feel like they can express themselves in. I think the, the way that I like to approach dance and movement is, is emotionally. I love movement that really comes, you know, from a very, whether it's joyful or full of sorrow or both, or whether it's funny or, you know, I, I don't know, it, it, whatever it is, it's, um, it comes from a place of feeling. And I guess I, I realize that it's really important if you're asking people to, you know, use their emotions and move that they feel safe and they feel like they can, can do that. So, um, yeah, it's something that's evolved gradually over the years. And I think is continuing to evolve, of course. Yeah, and I, I can attest to it firsthand as well, the, the feeling of being safe in the, in the studio with you, and it's, it's really an, a, an incredible thing. And when it comes to movement education, I think that there is a bit of a new wave of education that's starting to begin. And it's really a beautiful thing to see. Um, I don't know if you have much experience with this, but I know that for me, uh, there has been a few teachers that were not the most supportive in the formative years. And I think that a lot of people, I have a lot of friends in the industry um, or people that didn't end up pursuing a career in the industry because of basically abusive ways of, of educating. And for a lot of people, that was a reality, especially in the ballet world and a lot of other worlds. And what do you think is important that we address when it comes to abusive ways of, of educating? Well, I, I imagine that behavior like that is learned. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the awakening that we're having at this, you know, this period of history. Um, my, my hope is that it will, it will have the opposite effect. And because people are now so aware of how important it is for a student to feel safe. And I think, I think we're just more willing to question, um, <laughs> question educators than we were before. 
um, just in general in society. I mean, not necessarily in the classroom, but I think, you know, there was this sort of tradition of being silent and obedient, especially um, in the ballet classes that I took. I can only speak from my own experience. Um, and I think while there is still a seriousness in dance and, and, a, and an awareness that it is something that requires a great deal of discipline, I think that we're much less willing um, as a generation to accept any kind of abusive um, behavior. But I think I was really fortunate that I mostly, you know, the worst that ever happened to me personally was that I wasn't taken seriously. You know, it's like that was the hardest thing for me was, oh, he's, you know, he's like got a great imagination, but, you know, he's not going to get very far. You know, I, I certainly had that kind of, <laughs> that, that sort of thing happened to me. Um, I want to hear more about that too. So, because, you know, obviously there's, you've done some incredible work and are continuing to create such beautiful, incredible work and be seen in, in so many huge ways. So I want to know, like, if that was the experience, what kept you going and what, what made things change and what made people start to see you in this way? Well, what kept me going is just I had no choice. You know, I, I was talking to my partner recently about this. Someone had asked me in the talk back after a class, like, you know, how did you, when you were auditioning and you were getting cut all the time, how did you continue? And it was like, well, I, it wasn't a choice. It was just, I just continued. Like, I didn't feel that I could stop. <laughs> there was never mm -hmm. a moment where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to continue doing this. I was driven to do it. And my partner was like, yeah, it was, you were called. You were called to do it. And I think that that is a really wonderful way of, of thinking about it. And I felt then equally called to choreograph. I think people started taking me more seriously. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, <laughs> Um, where that sort of shift happened. I feel like I, as a dancer and a young person, I wasn't necessarily taken seriously um, because I didn't have turnout and I didn't have a lot of natural facility, but I had a lot of personality, as they say, right? <laughs> a lot of personality. Um, I still do, I guess. But um, as a choreographer, I think I, I, I had different experience. I think people were more willing to sort of um, acknowledge that I had some skill um, but I still feel now as a grown up, I think I'm a grown up. I still feel now like a lot of the perception sometimes of my work, maybe this is just my imposter syndrome is like, Oh, his work is so fun. It's so cute. You know, it's so, your stuff is always so fun. And, and there's like a tone to it, mm -hmm. um, that feels really condescending and sort of like minimizing. Yeah, like, oh, it's cute. Like, it's, it's not a great compliment. Uh, and I, I, don't, I think it's really hard to know how to talk about anyone's work, and so I never take it personally. But it's hard when, you, when you've spent your entire life on a craft and you take it incredibly seriously. If I'm doing something that's funny or if I'm teaching a class that's joyful, I take that very, very seriously. It's not accidental that that room is joyful. That takes a lot of care and presence and, you know, um, intention. So it's funny, this like reflection of like being young and, not be, and then sort of being old. And I think, yeah, that I still, I think, deal with that sometimes now. Yeah. And I think that the, the way that people value the work sometimes too, when it's looking so effortless and so beautiful, people don't really understand the amount of work and integrity that's behind that. Sure. Um, and I want to bring up, obviously you've heard this in the bio, but... Al is a choreographer for the hit TV series, So You Think You Can Dance. And didn't you win an Emmy? That's true, I did, right? during lockdown on my couch. Look at that. You won a friggin' Emmy. So that was in 2020. Um, I want to know if that changed anything. I mean, Al is like the most humble, um, very chill person to work with in the studio. So I just want to know if that changed anything or if that helped the imposter syndrome, what, you know, what was that experience like? It was super exciting. And I, I, I tried to do the work to really like accept that it had happened and, and not just sort of, cause usually I'm just like, Oh, got to keep moving. Got to keep working. Like I don't get on to the next, on to the next. Exactly. Um, but it was a lockdown. So I had some time to reflect and that was really nice. <laughs> Um, but no, I still feel the same. I don't think 
I, I don't know that, I can't say that anyone takes me more seriously now than they did. I, you know, it happened at a really not a great time for the industry. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see like an increase in, you know, opportunities. And, um, and I still feel as much of an imposter as ever. So <laughs> it's fun to, that it's there, you know, um, it, or that, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's cool. I'm so, I can definitely like say like, I worked hard for that and I, I can acknowledge that the work, you know, was, 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 um, celebrated or, you know, what is the word, I guess, recognized. And that's cool. But also, you know, at the end of the day, you have to get in the room and s still make up something new. And I can't say that it changed my process too much or my, uh, confidence. Yeah. Which I, I love talking about because I think that there is such a, kind of notion that once you reach a certain level of success or you get the award, you win the trophy, you get the gold, whatever it is that like all of a sudden your problems like melt away, you reach a certain amount of success and then you don't experience these things anymore. And that's something that I really try to communicate to people, especially younger people uh, beginning in the industry and things that your mental health, your life is not going to necessarily be perfect once you win the award or you are the best or you get the job. It's so much deeper than that. And I think that while it's amazing to strive for these incredible things in our lives, that we have to be kind of careful with what we value and more so, you know, think about aligning our lives to our values. Absolutely. And, and being, being present in whatever situation, you know, you're, you're in. I mean, I can't say that if I'm, you know, if I'm having a moment, um, where I, I'm, I'm not, uh, feeling on top of my game or I'm, I'm having a moment where I'm feeling stuck or I don't know what to do, which the Emmy doesn't help that. You know? yeah. It's not like I can like, just think I have an Emmy. Like it's not, that's not how I operate anyway. Wait, so you don't rub it and then you just get the <laughs> next like a job. Genie, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you know, it's like it, it, it's, but what you said about, about the values, it's important. I never, you know, that's not really what I set out to do. I was setting out to just make, make a thing that I felt like would connect to people. And, and yes, it felt so great to be, you know, rep, to be picked. I mean, but I, there's a, so much of my, my career is me feeling not like I'm not being picked. Mm. you know and the feeling of being picked is just constant in a career like this especially a freelance lifestyle mm -hmm. so i have to pick myself <laughs> yeah and this is something that we exactly you have to choose yourself something i've been saying a lot lately is believing in you know the power of you um and one of my favorite things that i was talking about on on another episode with storm is that that number of hours that you put into this life and this art form that nobody sees you know people see the shiny things and the accomplishments but it's the hours and hours that you that you really put in and um one of my favorite things is that you put in your bio believing in the power of dance and i think that that's such an, a a really incredible statement that i try to bring to people through dance education as well and even people that might not be classically trained dancers or, or working, you know, just people learning to love and enjoy dance and movement. Um, and I want to hear from you a little bit more about what that statement means to you, believing in the power of dance. Well, I, I believe that, I mean, from my own experience, dance makes me feel like my best self i feel like i am more empathetic through dance more sensitive i believe that dance can heal i believe that dance and music and um and togetherness um is a way of life and belongs to everyone if they want to be a part of it and you know what i I, when I work with young people, a lot of times I say, look, you know, when you've spent, like you said, so many, so many hours on something at a certain point, it, 
can become a tool. Like you can use dance as a tool. So I can use dance because of all of the years I've spent re refining my knowledge and awareness of it. I can use it to make a dance to tell a story, or I can use it to help brighten someone's day, or I can use it, you know, I can use dance to communicate. Um, and I think that's the, the difference, but dance is really belongs to everyone. And I sometimes, especially in New York, you know, dancers are professional dancers anyway, people who are trying to make money doing dance. It's just so easy to lose that awareness because you're trying to, you're trying to get picked. And I think that, and I've been there and I know that's a huge part of the process. So I think part of my calling right now is to just remind people of the beauty of what they're doing. Um, and I think, yeah. And with dance, it's, I mean, dance has existed since our culture has existed. Like dance has always been around and it's something that we need to value even more because we express ourselves through dance. We are able to deal with heavy emotions through dance and through movement. We're able to access our creativity. We're literally able to tap into our most spiritual selves through dance. And it's something so powerful that I don't feel like we are harnessing. In fact, we're taking all the money away, stripping all the money away, not valuing it in school systems. You know, the list goes on and on. So it's really voices like yours. This is why I'm, you know, such a big fan because we need more voices like that out there that are quite literally like fighting for dance. Yeah, and I, I there aren't many things that I think you're, body and your breath and your emotions are so so truly connected and and working together simultaneously and in a society where it is so impossible to feel present um i think that dance is more important than ever really oh yeah i i think for me i mean dance is like the most present that's why i started dancing was because the thoughts could never like turn off so dance was the only time that like the thoughts would turn off and then that led me, you know, into the next path, into the next path. And then even, you know, I, my first time meditating was in a dance class when I was a teenager, you know, it was actually not in a yoga class or it, you know, that was a, a really big opening up point and, and learning more about accessing your spirituality through dance and improvisation specifically was actually really life-changing for me and, and even my mental health. Uh, before I even knew it. So introducing these these tools to young people is is really important. And I want to talk to about Momen specifically. Um, so before we even get into it, I want to let you explain what Momen is. Um, so yeah, go for it. And then I, I obviously have a million thoughts because it's something I've experienced firsthand. Yeah, Momen is, um, is a, I guess a a collective, an organization that my partner and I started. And um, he's a graphic designer. And we wanted to we wanted to create something together. And I was feeling that my classes were, for a while I was teaching, for many years, all, all, about 10 years, I was teaching um, weekly classes at Broadway Dance Center and Steps on Broadway in New York City. And had created, you know, or, or had cultivated, you know, a really lovely group of of people that were regulars that were coming. Um, and I think that space and that class just started to didn't, didn't, it wasn't feeling big enough. I wanted to expand upon it. I also really like throwing parties. So <laughs> I, I think I, we sort of took these ideas and we're like, well, I also grew up doing dance conventions and loving dance conventions and, um, a dance convention for, if you don't know, it's, it's, it's a convention for dance. You come together, you dance for three days. You're totally exhausted. You take a ton of classes when you're a kid, there's often dance competition, but it's this very, ex, ex, uh, very intense three day experience. And as a kid, I would leave on Sunday evening, just completely inspired and motivated and full of ideas and, passion for dance. And I thought there was nothing like that for adults. And I would love to create something like that for adults here in New York. So we started during the pandemic. I just started giving a free warm up once a week as a way to, to just keep the community going. And to also, I just felt like I wanted to show up for people as they had showed up for me for so many years. And then we sort of called that moment, knowing that eventually we would want to turn it into an in-person event. And then we did. And, um, and you were at our very first one. 
that was the first one. We've done three so far. And um, right now there are three day events held in New York City. We don't know where it's going to go or what else we want to do, but we know that moment is sort of bigger than the three day event. We want to continue creating experiences for adult dancers um, to connect to their love of yeah, dance. Yeah, it's, it's really an incredible, and we'll definitely link to moment in the show notes as well so you guys can check it out, especially those in the New York City area. Um, but it really is a powerful, powerful weekend of dance. I think it's, you know, full disclosure, one of the ways that I got out of such a deep, like, dance depression during uh, when we were coming out of the, the pandemic. Um, and also, I don't think I ever told you this, but I, I took two classes virtually during the lockdown, only two, because it was honestly hard. And I know I'm not the only one. It was hard to to move in my living room. Al is here right now. He sees the slanted floor and how painful uh, <laughs> it is walking around here. And Al was one of two classes that I took. Those were the only two classes I took during the, the, the lockdown. Um, and it was such a brightening experience. And then um, I had to make sure that I was there for the first moment. And what was so incredible about the workshop is that you are really reattaching yourself to the exploration and the joy in movement and in dance, which is something that I can lose so quickly. Uh, and a lot of people who do it for, for work, who work in movement, any type of movement, you can sometimes lose the joy. And having people facilitate that again, through gathering, through meeting new people, through writing and talking about your feelings and then communicating them through dance with each other was, was really powerful. And I just have to say that you're definitely, you're onto something there. It's, it's really a powerful experience. Thank you so much for saying that. And I, you know, I think we knew, we, I, I think we knew that there was a need for something like this and we're continuing to learn, you know, what, what it is that people need, but, but it is, um, so moving to watch people sort of be reawakened to how much they love moving and, and doing it with other people. And that's been probably one of the most gratifying, you know, things I've ever experienced is just being able to facilitate that for people. And of course, doing it with the man I love. It's a bonus. Yeah. I loved that too. And, you know, there were a lot of tears even that weekend. It wasn't just me that was like so awakened by this experience. Um, but I also wanna ask when it comes to educating today, post pandemic, where we're at, where dancers are at, where artists are at in general, what kind of pattern are you seeing that we're emerging that, that's kind of coming out with, with dancers that you're seeing now? Well, again, I can only speak from my own experience. Um, and this is tough. This, this is tough. I, I, well, I mean, I think that there are, it, it boggles my mind. I'll start with the positive, just of how many people are in it as completely obsessed with dance as ever and committing themselves to a life in dance and, and training beautifully. And the amount of talent is extraordinary uh, here in New York City and around the world, really. Um, for, as from a teaching standpoint, what I'm feeling is, you know, um, I put a lot of energy into creating a, a, a class and a space and a beginning, middle and end and, and ideas and, and making sure everyone feels seen and, um, you know, providing, uh, a challenging, fruitful experience for anyone that, that chooses to participate. What I'm feeling now is that there's just um, I get the sense at the end of a class, like people want a lot more. <laughs> they want mm -hmm. more than what I've already been able to give. And I think that we're at a time where there aren't a lot of answers. It's a tough time to be, you know, in the freelance art industry. <laughs> and, but, un but unfortunately, you know, I, I can't really give more than what I've given in that, in the class. And I, I don't know whether people are wanting um, healing, you know, where they're wanting, I, I, my sense is that they want um, answers to their career or they want, mm -hmm. they want someone to pick them, you know, but that's never been what class has really been about for me. 
and um, and I don't have the answer to what I think that they, you know, but it's just a feeling that I'm getting. And sometimes I have to say that I do feel overwhelmed by it. Um, I don't think that there are any easy answers to this lifestyle and they're never going to be, you know, it's a process and it's a day by day process. And it's also reinventing and figuring and surviving if you're living in the city and figuring out what, you know, and navigating day by day, but a class is a class's purpose is to is to bring you into a space, feel present, and explore ideas, and you know, and that's the gift of it. It's not there to help you move further in your career or to give you answers um, to you know burning questions that you may have about how to make it in the industry. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, yeah, completely. And I think it's something that can be even brought into so many of different, you know, your yoga practice, when you're, when you're laying down the mat, it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's not necessarily the time to prove yourself. It's the time to explore, to experience your body and to, to be at one with yourself and your breath. However, I, as, as someone who, who is working, it is such a scary time right now to be to be a performer. I mean, I can only imagine being 22. I mean, it, you know, coming out, you've had your last like year or two of school where you're like doing all of your classes virtually and, you know, not having that same type of experience. And then you're, you know, you're coming out and there's not a lot of answers. And I think that even for me and these years of work, I felt as if it was kind of like starting over. What is, is one thing that you turn to that helps to ground you or root you so that in this industry that can be so many what ifs, so many no's, so many doors closed, what's one practice that keeps you rooted or keeps you with your feet on the ground. Well, ironically, it's dance class. I think that's partly why I said what I said is for me, it's like I go, I take a class, ah, you know. <laughs> but I think what I'm feeling is, and maybe it's me, maybe it's because I'm not teaching as often or, you know, because maybe I work in the industry so people feel like they're auditioning or something if they're coming to class, mm. which makes me sad because that's never what I want my class to feel like. But that's why I get frustrated is it's like, you come, you take the class and it's like, okay, like it's not, if we start expecting class to be the thing that, um, that moves our career forward, I worry that, that, I guess it's the thing every class now is, you know, feels like a video shoot and it feels like an opportunity to get footage <laughs> or an opportunity to like get content. And to me, and that's fine. And every everyone's space and class is their own and they can facilitate it however they want and there's no judgment. But for me, that is the last thing that I'm thinking about in a dance class. I want people to feel in their body and connect to their sense of um, expression and physicality. So, um, yeah, that's what I do, you know. I, I move. Or I go out yeah. dancing, you know. I like going out dancing a lot. It's interesting because I think for me, I definitely can relate to those people sometimes. I, it, Especially now that we're back and we are live and in person, sometimes when I come to take class, it feels like audition vibe. That's why I'm very like choosy with when and where I go to class and with who because uh, most of the time it leaves me feeling um, like I'm 10 steps back than where I was, you know? And especially if I'm not like, you know, in, in the right environment or just not feeling good, it makes me feel like, oh, I'm not, you know, the, the this or the that. Well, and I think... I think that it's probably good that there are classes like that because I think that some dancers need a place to practice, you know, being seen and pushing whatever. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think that if you're going to work in the industry, like, I guess for some people that is important to be in a space like that, but it doesn't work for everyone. 
um, you know, and I think you, we have to be sensitive to like, well, how is this making me feel? Yeah. And then, you know, and then shift our energy accordingly. Um, and I think that's, what's frustrating for me is it's like, if you know anything about me, you know, that like that class is very important to me. And, um, so if you, if you're coming and you're, you're doing it as an excuse to meet me or like, you know, try to get a job, it, yeah, it's a turn off. Yeah. And I think it, it kind of applies to with people, if you are taking class because you're forcing yourself to, and this is not just dance, I'm, you know, I'm bringing it into all movement practices. And when you decide to take class, if you're doing it as a way to force yourself or to punish yourself, you're taking away the true beauty and power of your movement practice. And that's something that I, you know, try to stress with my teachings. If you, if you turn on one of my classes, I want you to do what is going to feel good and not force yourself to show up, to show out or to, you know, do the hardest thing or sweat the most or look at your Fitbit watch or whatever and see the, the most calories burned or whatever. I want you to start to develop a movement practice that is healing and nourishing for yourself and your body. And that's something a little bit that I think that we've missed. And I don't know if you've seen this as well with either dance education or workouts that you see or things that are, are gearing towards that self-punishment kind of mentality, or if you see that at all in, in the work that you do. I mean, I certainly don't gravitate towards things like that. So I, <laughs> I, feel like I tend to be like you and I surround myself with, you know, people that are that are doing it for, you know, because they want to feel calm and good and healthy and connected. So, but I, I, you know, but I also think that there are people that really want that, you know, so, you know, like they want to like someone to kick their ass or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And I do think that sometimes I worry as an educator that I'm not providing enough of a challenge for people because I'm so worried about making sure that they feel safe and good. And, um, and so that's something that I struggle with too. It's like, I, there is something in a dance class about, about tackling something that's challenging and maybe not even getting it, you know, like maybe you don't figure it out, but there's like something about putting yourself through that, that is, I think important. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's just like the, the way that we approach it and the way we talk about it. Um, but I, it's something that I struggle with. It's like, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to roll to the floor because people don't want to go to the floor. And it's going to like, they're, they, you know, and it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe it will, they'll feel so like incredible about the fact that they rolled to the floor and got back up and also make, maybe my job isn't to make sure everyone's comfortable. Maybe my job is to like, I don't know, um, be truthful to what I, as an artist, want to explore or I'm curious about. Yeah, I agree. And when it comes to creation, thinking about what other people are going to think right off the bat is never always going to, you know, lead to our most authentic stuff. And I want to know when it comes to uh, another thing that I want to link in the show notes is the one of the dances that you made for So You Think, the L-O-V-E dance that is so beautiful. Um, cause Al's work just has the ability to both be very technical and beautiful, but also tell a story. And I want to know when it comes to the creative process, what motivates you to create or what, what brings you to this place where you can, can be open and creative? It depends. I think, you know, for a show like that, it's a, it's task driven. So it's like, I have an assignment and I have I have parameters, so I like, and I, I tend to work well that way. Um, you know, I've also made a lot of original work. That's getting, lately that's been harder for me, like trying to write something and come up with something that's brand new. Maybe because I've been sort of like, now getting kind of used to having parameters given to me. Um, but I, it's very instinctual. It's also about, I think, just really seeing what's in front of you seeing the people that are in front of you, seeing what's working, seeing what's not, 
and and taking them and creating something for them, not something that is about me and what I think it should be, but being like, okay, who are these people? What are they like? What's their chemistry like? What, you know, and just sort of letting that be as part of the process as the ideas that I had, you know, three weeks before. Yeah, and I feel like that comes into play with just being present with where you're at and and not constantly second guessing or overthinking everything, but being able to be in the space and truly react to the surroundings around you. Yes, and that takes a lot of practice. And I think that that's something that, I think that that's something that is if you're a young educator or, or a choreographer specifically, you know, being in a room with people like over and over and over and over and over again, it's really the way to practice doing that, which I'm not saying it's easy to get a bunch of people in a room <laughs> in New York, especially New York city, uh, you know, where studio space is so expensive. But I think that that's, you know, it takes practice to be able to walk into a room with people that you maybe not don't know and see them and try something and see how that goes and then move from there. Um, Cause nine times out of 10, what I have planned doesn't work. Mm -hmm. in any given situation. Yeah, and I mean, it's. I think it takes so much courage to walk into a space like that and be able to create, to tell people what to do, to communicate, to facilitate the energy that's happening around you. I mean, it's, it's a really scary thing. Um, and when it comes to this, like, how do you how do you handle a space where you feel like the energy is not something that's feeding the process? <laughs> I mean, it, honestly, Mark, my job is to make sure it is like, that's my number one job. So, you know, I'm very particular about who is in that room. Um, and I, and I tend to cast or invite based on that. Um, you know, and sometimes you don't have control over it. And you just do the best, you just do the best that you can. I mean, I, you know, I've been really fortunate. I also think that part of what my work is, is to like know how to respond. A lot of times I'm a tend to be a very calm person. I, you know, I will reflect off of what's around me. And if, if it's required for me to, to, to be more high energy and more assertive, and more demanding or more, you know, um, just a stronger, louder leader, I, I do that. If it's required of me for the, you know, it, for the good of the work to turn myself to the very calm, calmest, most quiet version of myself, then I'll do that. You know, so I have to be incredibly adaptable. And I think that's the answer to your question is to adapt to what's around you in order to make sure that the, the rehearsal or the, the process is fruitful and, um, Productive. Yeah, because I think that in this industry and a lot of other industries, kindness is not really the number one uh, trait that we we tend to navigate towards when we're in a uh, a role of uh, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, a leadership role, especially in the entertainment industry. So that's what I want to to communicate to people as well how are you able to lead with kindness in this way or you know what ways do you lead with kindness i mean honestly it boggles my mind that not everyone operates this way like i just yeah. can't believe that i just can't believe that anyone could do to, to be in a room and not i just don't it, it's yeah and i can't say that i haven't been in rooms like that it's been a while you know i'm very fortunate now to have either been running a room that i'm in or you know, or be assisting working with someone that I know that they have similar values. Um, look, I mean, that is, um, I don't, geez. I think at a certain point, if we're talking about dance and of course, like that's what I know. Right. So you, what, what the work is going to be, they're human beings mm -hmm. and it's emotional and it's, it, and it requires a great deal of confidence. You know, it's weird what we do. <laughs> yeah. It's strange and it's very, very vulnerable. So it just doesn't make sense to me that you would 
make someone, you know, boss or, or push someone into like dancing or, you know, or I, I just, that being cruel could possibly have the kind of results, you know, that, that, a choreographer would want. So I don't I don't know how I do it. It's just kind of the way I am and and it's really effective. So it doesn't make any sense for me to be any other way. I mean, I'm not do, I don't I'm not nice because I want to be effective. Um I'm just sort of nice and you know and I've and I can also be very productive. I don't know, it's interesting. It is it's it for those of you that are listening that are you know this is kind of your first time maybe hearing about some of the insides of the dance industry or entertainment industry, it is a it has for a long time been a place of incredibly abusive behavior, completely unchecked for basically since its inception. So I I really try to give voice and to, I mean both in my teaching and you know whenever I'm in a leadership role as well lead with kindness. But that's why I wanted to have you on the podcast even to begin with is because I feel like you're a, a leader of change when it comes to being in these spaces. And I think that it's something that I want to see being done more often because I, I have certainly been in those rooms where it's, it's not been that case. And I see a change slowly starting to trickle in, but I also see a lot of the same behavior. So what is, what is a change that you really want to see in the future of, of our work, in the future of dance creation or dance education? Well, this is slightly off of, off of the point that you're making. The biggest change I would want to see is just more opportunity, you know, of course, for everyone. Yeah, we need to hire more dancers. We need more dance in everything, in school, you know. <laughs> and even when they get hired, they're often just so terribly undervalued and underappreciated. But we carry on. Um, we carry on. You know, um, I just, in my experience now with the younger generation, I don't think that that kind of behavior is going to fly anymore. I just, I think people are realizing it's not that effective. I think people are realizing that it is abusive. Um, and I think that, I do think that there's a shift. But again, I've only been in my rooms. And I think that what you're saying is is true. I think that there's been a lot of just um, stifling and, you know, this perfectionism, trying to fit yourself into a, you know, be the perfect body, be the perfect dancer, be the perfect vessel for someone else, uh, have someone else's vision. You know, that has been definitely a part of what dance culture has been. But I do think it's changing. And I think that I am not even necessarily like the start of that change. I think the reason I'm able to be the way I am is because there has been some change before me, you know. There were teachers that I had that didn't treat me that way. And so I think it's a continuum. And hopefully, you know, part of the reason why I think I teach so much is because I want to pass that on to other people who will then, you know, carry on with the same principles. And I think that's the best that I can do, really, you know. Yeah. And I think that the more that we're able to be vulnerable ourselves and lead through an example of owner vulnerability the more that we will open the door for those those other people who are you know eventually be in the rooms leading as well so that key to vulnerability and and allowing yourself to be open to everybody in the room to respect the other bodies in the room because it's it's tough stuff being a dancer putting yourself I mean it's your body it's it's like the most vulnerable that you can be is just you know your body in the space right there and looking at the mirror and and all the judgments that go with it so one last question is how would you I guess, give advice to anyone on allowing themselves to be more vulnerable and to put themselves out there and to be okay with being vulnerable. The things that I, um, in some ways, were like the most ashamed of as a younger person have slowly become um, some of my favorite parts of myself. I think, first of all, being aware that 
when you're at any point, we're continually evolving and shifting and changing. So it's really easy to grab onto this idea of who you think you are and hold on really tight to it and keep trying to prove to yourself that that's who you are. But sometimes if you can just loosen that grip a little bit, you might become a fuller version of who you are in the sense that I, you know, wanted to be this serious dancer when I allowed, and I, you know, and I, I I hated the limitations of my body and I hated the fact that dance teachers, you know, thought that I had a lot of personality, but not necessarily a lot of skill, but that personality is ultimately the thing that, that has given me this career, you know? Um, I think being dissatisfied or, or, or not always being satisfied with where you're at is healthy. Um, being, you know, hungry for more, wanting more is healthy, but also embracing where you're at and, and opening up your mind to the idea that, you know, you might be amazing at things that you haven't tried yet or avenues that you haven't gone down yet. Um, so, and that's advice I should take myself. You know, it's like, I have to keep giving myself the grace to, to be changing and to want different things and to give up on some dreams and embrace new ones. Mm, I love that. I'm taking that advice. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I'll report back to you. But I think that that is something that I'm, that I see in myself struggling with as well is just allowing yourself to be open to you. You know, and not not you that you're seeing as your image, the way that you want to come across, the the body that you want to have, the life that you want to have, but the openness to just being you and just loving exactly what that is. And to be honest, all of the times of my life where things have aligned, it's because I was actually just being myself and maybe being okay with not the exact image or the exact thing that I thought that I would be. So I'm taking that advice and I'm gonna run with it too. I will too, Mark. <laughs> Thank you so much, Al. This was, this was so wonderful. Um, where, where can the listeners find you as well? Uh, you can follow me at Al Blackstone Choreo, which is choreography without the Graphy. And uh, I have a website, which is alblackstone.net. Uh, That's great. Um, and we'll link to, to that in the show notes. We'll, we'll link to Moment to some fun stuff so you can get to know Al um, and his amazing, amazing work a little bit more. But this was such a pleasure. Um, I love having you in the space. I'm staring at him from a screen, but he's like six feet away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the most fun thing ever. Um, but thank you so much, Al. Thank you so much to the listeners. And uh, once again, just a moment of gratitude for, for being a part of these conversations. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. And I hope to, to chat with you all and move with you all again soon. So enjoy your day. Thank you to our entire team behind the scenes at GLOW. I'm so grateful for your care and commitment to serving our members around the world. Thank you to our teachers for so beautifully sharing your gifts and talents. I'm also grateful to our lovely community of GLOW members. You've supported us since 2008, and because of you, we get to continue to do the work we love. It's the combined support of our team, our teachers, and our community that grants me the privilege to continue to bring you the GLOW podcast. Thank you to Lee Schneider at Red Cub Agency for production support. And the beautiful music you're hearing now is by Carrie Rodriguez and her husband, Luke Jacobs. And remember, take care of yourself because our world needs you. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. You can find The Glow Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or glo.com slash podcast, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm Derek Mills. Derek Mills.